Hey hey, Marcus House with you here and today we are talking about SpaceX, NASA, Boeing and other space agencies plans to keep their astronauts safe from dangerous levels of radiation while traveling to the moon or even further to Mars. Now there are two main sources of radiation I'll cover here, those being from the Van Allen radiation belts around the Earth and the other from more sparse but still dangerous solar radiation, solar flares from our sun as well as cosmic rays. Now I believe this topic is certainly one of the most commented questions or hotly debated queries on many of my videos. I've had a bunch of comments in particular about SpaceX's upcoming Starship vessel not having adequate shielding along with more historical Apollo missions. Now from people that don't believe the Apollo missions really did land humans on the moon, this topic is raised all the time. They claim that if a human was to pass through the Van Allen belts with the Apollo spacecraft, they would have essentially received a dose of radiation far too great to have survived for the mission, let alone to pass through the belts on the return journey, complete the mission and still show no real signs of radiation sickness. No matter if we're talking SpaceX's Starship or Apollo, this issue is the same. So how did NASA protect astronauts 50 years ago? What have we learned since the Apollo missions? And how are SpaceX and NASA going to protect astronauts in upcoming missions to the moon which could be coming up in only a few years? Let's talk a little about the types of radiation we need to be aware of. Firstly, the Van Allen radiation belts. The discovery of the belts was made by several satellites in the late 50s such as Explorer 1 and Pioneer 3. James Van Allen is credited with the discovery as his instruments were used on the satellites. He discovered that there are multiple dynamically changing belts, kind of donut shaped that surround the Earth. These belts are made up of charged particles, most of which come from the sun, are captured and held there by the Earth's magnetic field. Now there are basically two different distinct belts um, and other temporary belts which can also appear and disappear with a regular solar activity. Earth's two main belts sit at an altitude around 640 kilometers to 58,000 kilometers and there are very distinct regions within these altitudes with varying levels of radiation. The belts are located in the inner area of Earth's magnetic field and although these belts form a terrific shield around the Earth which protects the atmosphere from rapid destruction, they do also form a quite dangerous layer of radiation that makes travel away from Earth more problematic for humans. Another issue is that the belts are not great for sensitive electronic components found in satellites and spacecraft. Interestingly, NASA has also observed cases of temporary belts being created and destroyed such as back in 2013. The Van Allen probes that NASA had launched in 2012 have been super useful and have since discovered a temporary third radiation belt. This belt was observed for four weeks and it was then destroyed by a solar flare. Now when we talk about radiation within the Van Allen belts here, we are talking mainly about charged particles. The behavior of this type of radiation is quite different from electromagnetic radiation sources which is what most people immediately think about when they hear the term radiation. The typical claim from moon landing deniers is that there is too much radiation in outer space for manned space travel and to quote a little from quite an old site linked in the description, after witnessing the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the tragedy of Chernobyl, it is not surprising that the idea of radiation should elicit an intuitively fearful reaction. But when you understand the different types of radiation and what can be done about them, it becomes a manageable problem to avoid radiation exposure. Now there are of course various forms of damaging electromagnetic radiation constantly coming from our sun as well as cosmic rays originating from outside the solar system. The main source of radiation from the Van Allen belts themselves are from high energy charged particles such as alpha particles, 
beta particles and protons. Alpha particles are quite large and because of that they are really quite easy to shield against. A large percentage can even be blocked by something as simple as a sheet of paper. Even if alpha particles hit someone directly they cannot even really penetrate much further than the top layer of dead skin. Not a real source of worry there. Beta particles however are electrons which are very tiny and can penetrate centimetres into the body. Luckily these are so very small that they do very little damage. Beta particles can be blocked reasonably well with only a few millimetres of aluminum uh, but one of the best ways to block these particles is with material containing a large percentage of hydrogen. Around 10 centimetres of water as an example will effectively block almost all beta particles. We need to take some water to, you know, survive, so that's great. Uh, but water is pretty ineffective as a shielding material given that you can't really use it as a building material for walls and radiation shelters. A great material that blocks beta particles is high density polyethylene, which is made up essentially of carbon and hydrogen. For those out there suggesting a thick lead shield would be required to block all the intense radiation, the opposite is actually true. When beta particles hit heavy metal atoms, the impact causes those atoms of lead to produce x-rays. So wait, in this case you need lead shielding to block the x-rays created by the lead shielding? That's probably not the greatest idea to fly a bunch of lead through the belts. Now the inner Van Allen belt is a lot stronger than the outer belt but it's also quite a lot smaller. With the Apollo missions as well as future missions by other launch providers such as SpaceX, the idea is to pass through the belts as fast as practical after the translunar injection burn. And then on the return mission to again pass through as rapidly as possible to minimize the time the spacecraft is exposed within the belts. Another huge factor that doesn't get talked about a great deal is that missions such as Apollo didn't fly straight through the most intense areas of the belts. They largely flew around them. Apollo 11's translunar trajectory was inclined allowing the spacecraft to rise quickly up above the equatorial plane as it headed away from the Earth. As you can see from this diagram Apollo 11 easily avoided the most intense areas of both the inner and outer belts and this greatly minimized the exposure that could have occurred. The red dots in this image mark the time in 10 minute increments as Apollo traveled away from the Earth. Here you can see that the inner region with the most energetic particles was passed in only around 10 minutes or so. The entire inner zone here was passed in roughly 30 minutes and the entire belt passed in around 90 minutes. Again, the path taken here was significantly outside the most concentrated parts of both the inner and outer belts. The records of radiation on the Apollo missions are all publicly accessible and even in the worst case scenario of Apollo 14 here with 1.14 rads of total exposure for the mission, um, exposure to the astronauts because of all these factors was you know, really quite minimal. Now don't get me wrong on all this, radiation is certainly dangerous to a degree and it is something that needs real engineering and clever mission planning to help minimize exposure as much as practical. But it is certainly not the insurmountable issue that many make it out to be. Um, nothing has ever been said by SpaceX or NASA that indicates that it's an issue that can't be solved. In the end, exploration is a dangerous business and there are many professions other than astronauts with strict limits to the amount of radiation an individual can be exposed to. International standards as an example allow exposure of as much as 50 millisieverts a year for workers who deal with radioactive material. NASA's limit of radiation exposure in low Earth orbit of 50 millisieverts per year also applies here. However, it is worth noting that acceptable limits are determined based on a few factors. Younger astronauts as an example are presumed to have a longer remaining lifespan than older astronauts and therefore exposure to larger amounts of radiation early in their careers could present greater health risks during their old age. 
for their entire career, the dose limit is based upon a maximum 3% lifetime excess risk of cancer mortality. The total equivalent dose yielding this risk depends on gender and age at the start of radiation exposure. So this essentially assumes that a younger person should be exposed to less radiation because they have more life to live and therefore a longer chance to develop future health problems. Trips to the moon with Apollo were very short. 10 to 12 day missions is far from SpaceX's long term goal of flying people to Mars, which for a one way trip will take a minimum of around 130 days or so. Even though the Van Allen belts will only take a tiny amount of time to pass through on the way out of Earth's gravity well, the real potential danger is the long term exposure to cosmic rays. Now, Cosmic rays are mostly made up of particles from exploded stars elsewhere in the Milky Way galaxy and these things constantly bombard our solar system. If the Van Allen radiation belts and general radiation from our sun were like a heavy hailstorm, cosmic rays are more like a light drizzle of machine gun fire. This drizzle is made up of extremely high energy particles moving at near light speeds. And these particles can be more powerful than even the most energetic solar particles. The same shielding that would block the vast majority of radiation from the crew on a trip to the moon would need to be at a different level again to keep most cosmic rays at bay. So for a long term length Mars trip, the cosmic rays are a much more serious problem. Interestingly, our sun can help a little here at certain times in its solar cycle. The solar minimum is a period of the least solar activity in the 11 year solar cycle of the sun. And during this time, sunspots and solar flare activity is quite low. Whereas at solar maximum, there may be hundreds of sunspots. Now, the solar system has its own field that we call the heliosphere. This animation shows the variation in the size of this boundary and it dictates how many cosmic rays reach the inner solar system versus how many are deflected away. As the heliosphere expands at solar maximum, it blocks more cosmic rays and as it contracts down to a minimum, more cosmic rays get through. Future missions to Mars may benefit from selecting a transit time that is quite close to solar maximum to find the best sweet spot between radiation from our sun and the cosmic rays flying in from all directions. The next solar maximum should be around 2024 or 2025. So it's going to be interesting to find out more as concrete plans evolve. Now development of the Starship is not all public. There is a lot we do know based on what we've seen from the current Starship development, but there's also a great deal of planning and development that we have really got zero idea about. Based on an old document from 2017, we are still assuming that there will be a solar storm shelter incorporated into the latest Starship design. This would allow passengers to take cover when heavy bursts of radiation are coming from solar flares. So as you can see, there is quite a misconception about the severity of the dangers of radiation in these flights. It's really not as dangerous as many people believe, especially when the most appropriate flight profiles are taken and when adequate shielding materials are used. If you're interested in the doses of radiation recorded from the Apollo missions compared to say other common sources, you might find this video from the Veritasium channel quite interesting. I've got this link here in the top right for you to have a watch. Now you might be surprised just how much radiation we are constantly exposed to in our general lives. Compared uh, to a trip to the moon, it really isn't that big of a deal. And if you're a smoker, you might just be a little surprised at how much radiation you can receive in comparison to an astronaut. Now I'd like to know what you all think. Would you be happy to pass through the Van Allen belts and risk the dangers of cosmic radiation for a chance to travel to the moon or even to Mars? Let me know in the comments below. Uh, of course, a huge thank you to everyone here for watching. If you like this content and would like to support what I do here, please do take a second to subscribe, like and share. Your support is incredible and without you, I just couldn't do what I'm doing here. As always, a massive thank you to my incredible quality control squad listed here. If you are interested in these topics and you would like to be part of the awesome research and discussions that we go through, follow my Discord link in the description and join us all in there. 
Today in the tile in the bottom left we have my Star Hopper 150 meter flight video from the other week. What an amazing achievement this was. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right a video that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.